Hello there, Internet, and welcome to the first in a video series which will take you through developing an FPGA board. Now, if you're not interested in seeing an overview, getting an introduction, top level sort of stuff, block diagrams, that sort of thing, you can jump ahead into the second video, which gets really down into the nuts and bolts of doing stuff uh, in CAD packages and whatnot. Um, however, this is a good introduction to FPGAs and FPGA configuration, that sort of thing. So if you're interested, by all means, stick around. Now, we're going to build an FPGA board, but we're going to do it in the context of Arduino. And in this case, uh, we're going to build an FPGA Arduino shield. What that's going to allow us to do is essentially plug the FPGA into the Arduino and extend the Arduino's capability through the FPGA. Now, which one is slave and which one is master under that configuration is, uh, you know, kind of subject to debate because the FPGA that we're choosing has such tremendous horsepower. However, um, we can go ahead and make those decisions later after we've got the board together. Still, we're going to have a really cool FPGA board that we can play with. So. In this case, I want to go ahead and jump right in. Now, my project is actually being documented in projects.hackaday.com. If you're interested, jump up onto the website and you can find the project listed as Arduino FPGA Shield. Nothing original there. Now, I want to take you through and kind of give you a sense of the overall architecture of the system. Now, down here is a block diagram of the FPGA system that I intend to build. At the center of the design is a Xilinx Spartan 6. This is the LX9. Uh, this FPGA has got a tremendous amount of horsepower. Now, it comes in a QFP package uh, and a BGA package. I've chosen a QFP because it's a lot easier to solder to, and then equally you can stick probes to the pins on that a lot more easily without having to do a bunch of breakout vias and that sort of thing. Now, the Spartan 6 FPGA is a field programmable gate array. That's the FPGA acronym. Now, the field programmability means that I don't have to take the device off of the board to actually do the programming. Uh, the gate array component of that means that the FPGA itself is really a sea of logic that I can string together to create other more sophisticated, more abstract logic blocks. So if at the very lowest level that logic is represented as gates, well, you know through digital logic that you can combine gates together to create things like multiplexers and even going more abstract things like counters or shift registers and then going even more abstract the collection of those things could be things like well an SPI controller or I could start to build more sophisticated peripherals even microprocessors so it's kind of like having a field programmable application specific integrated circuit so it doesn't require that we send some Thing off to a semiconductor fab to actually get it built. Uh, however, we can go ahead and reprogram the device and still have the same flexibility as we have when we're dictating what's going inside of the chip. We are creating the chip itself from the proverbial digital ether, I guess, so to speak. Now, it's field programmable, which means that the FPGA, as it begins, has no knowledge of what its function is. Okay, we need to program that into the FPGA. The way that we're going to do that is by storing its configuration somewhere. Well, similar to a microprocessor, okay, microprocessors, you have the program that executes, and the program is usually stored in Flash. When the microprocessor boots up, the program that's going to run on the microprocessor, whether that's stored on an external Flash device or on Flash inside of the microprocessor, sort of six of one, half dozen of the other, but that program is loaded into the microprocessor and it starts executing. From there, we have some external memory, usually what we call data memory. Uh, could be SRAM, could be SDRAM, and that's where we're actually storing the stuff that the program is producing during the execution of the program itself. Well, FPGA is very similar in terms of its initial configuration. In this case, it, the device that we've chosen doesn't have any onboard flash. So we're going to use an SPI configuration flash. What that means is, is that by way of the SPI bus, I'm going to load the FPGA's configuration <clears throat> when the FPGA starts up. So on the FPGA's boot sequence, it goes to some register address, which we define inside, uh, uh, inside its configuration, loads that uh, configuration from the flash device and then copies that configuration over into the FPGA, configuring the FPGA to perform some function. Now, 
FPGAs are unique in that they, again, don't have a predefined function like a microprocessor or a microcontroller, which would mean that we needed an external memory device like an SDRAM or an SRAM device. In this case, it's arguable that we don't actually need it. However, I'm going to include it because the FPGA that I've chosen actually has enough grunt that it could have a microprocessor even stored inside of it. So that would allow us to do something like deploy a second microprocessor along the signal chain with the Arduino board, which this thing plugs into. Now, this board I'm going to design to be standalone to the extent that you don't need the Arduino. So this can be its own standalone FPGA board. However, including this along the signal chain with the Arduino actually kind of adds some new and interesting capabilities. Not the least of which is that, you know, hey, the Arduino is limited in terms of its I.O., it's limited in terms of its peripherals. The FPGA provides us a means to extend all of that. So this FPGA device that we've chosen has 144 pins on it. That gives us a lot of resources to be able to plug into a whole bunch of things which we couldn't normally do if we were limited to the headers that are available to us on the Arduino board. Now, that's driven me to include, now in this case, they look like uh, a second row of headers here, additional I.O., but I've decided to include a range of additional I.O., which are basically broken out from the FPGA itself. So the logic inside of the FPGA can map signals to these additional I.O. pins that are available to me here. Now, they could be a row header like this, or I may choose to do that more like perf board in this case. And it's, it, you know, again, six of one, half dozen of the other. I'm not entirely sure, but I'm not wedded to either one at this stage. So by all means, throw some comments in the video if you want to see it shape up one way versus another. Now, because in this case, the FPGA itself is using a spy configuration flash, I'm going to bring up the ICSP header from the underlying Arduino board, which gives us the SPI bus, which would allow us to actually program this flash. So the Arduino would actually be able to program the configuration of the FPGA into the SPI configuration flash. So in this case, if I had, for example, the FPGA's configuration on an SD card, and I wanted the Arduino to copy that into the SPI configuration flash, and then trigger the boot sequence on the FPGA, I could do that and the FPGA would boot with the configuration which is stored on the flash device. Just a cool way for the Arduino to actually kind of master the FPGA under this configuration. Now, I'll just briefly bring you through the project contents which are here on Hackaday Projects. Now, I've got a simple description here, probably more important are my details. My target here is to keep the cost below $30 for this board, however, I think I can do it for under $25. And over the course of developing the board, we'll do some things to try to do some cost optimization and drive the cost of this down so we can build an FPGA board which plugs into an Arduino for 25 bucks. And again, that board doesn't need to be used in the context of Arduino. So we'll have some flexibility there uh, and extensibility there. We can take that board off and we can do some other interesting things with it. Now, down below here is a component list. And in that list of components, I've got my flash device, I've got my FPGA device, again, 144 pin package here. Uh, and then I've got an SDRAM device. Now, you know, to be honest, I'm not wedded to the chip that I've chosen so far. Uh, this could very well change, but at this point, it's more a placeholder than anything else. Now, I've got some additional resources over here as links that you can jump to. So here's the project in Git. I've got uh, some pricing information. This is actually stored on fine chips. Um, and then I've got some of the additional documentation here. Now, down below here, I've got my project logs and some build instructions. I'm storing all of the references to datasheets or all of the datasheets themselves actually in a site called datasheet.net. And on datasheet.net, one of the cool things, I can load up the datasheet, so I search for the datasheet, but then I can also go ahead and add snippets and do some markup on the datasheet itself. So in this case, off to the side here, I've got all of these snippets, for example, a snippet for the pin diagram or a snippet for the package drawing. I've snipped those pieces out of the datasheet just to kind of shortcut the process of you trying to dig up that information. However, you'll find that information there, and I've gone ahead and made all of that information public. So when you search for the datasheet for that Spansheet flash memory part, you'll see all of my snippets publicly available along the side of the screen there. So 
just a cool and easy way to get to the documentation and get to the resources that we're actually going to be using. So that said, that's kind of an overview of the overall project and what we're going to go ahead and start building. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into the second video and we'll actually start the process of building library components, stringing some stuff together and creating our schematics.